two places in the New Testament. First of all, I want you to turn to Mark chapter 5. And uh, secondly, to Luke chapter 4. Mark 5 and Luke 4. Mark 5, and I'm going to begin reading <clears throat> verse 35. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mark chapter 5. And let's begin at verse 35. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter and James and John, the brother of Peter, uh, or rather, John, the brother of James. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and seeth the tumult, and them that wept and wailed greatly, and when he was come, he saith unto, the, unto them, Why make ye this ado, and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel, and them that were with him, the other three disciples, and entered into where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha kumi, which is being interpreted, Damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And she straightway, rather, and straightway the damsel arose and walked. She was of the age of twelve years, and they were astonished with great astonishment. And he charged them straightway um, that no man should know it, and commanded that something be given her to eat. Now go forward, if you will, to Luke. You might keep your hand here in Mark 5, but go forward if you haven't lost it yet to Luke chapter 4. got a new Bible and the pages are still stuck together and something. Luke chapter 4 and let's begin there at verse 33. Luke uh, 4 starting at verse 33. And in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? I know thee, excuse me, art thou come to destroy us? I know thee, who thou art, the Holy One of Israel. Let's, um, Keep your fingers there in uh, Mark chapter 5. But I missed it by one day. However, you probably didn't miss it at all. And that is, yesterday was Halloween here in the United States and perhaps other countries now uh, as well. But um, 
evil and uh, devilish ideas uh, are paraded on October 31st. Every year, um, people enjoy it more than they do having Thanksgiving with their family members, more than probably any other holiday. They seem to be obsessed with unclean spirits and devils and demons. Um, on on um, November 1st, November 1st is considered All Saints Day in Roman Catholicism. They pause to honor all of their saints. They have a couple thousand of them. And uh, it's, it's difficult for every Roman Catholic to remember all the names of all of them and what they're famous for. So they set aside one day uh, in which they will remember and honor all the saints. Just in case they forget one during the year, during the year they have a special day set aside for, for all of them at once. Um, in uh, Haiti, in the country of Haiti, it's been said that um, the country of Haiti is 95% Roman Catholic, but it is 100% voodoo. And you can get that testimony from the State Department and from many missionaries that have been there for a while. It's 95% Roman Catholic, but 100% voodoo. Roman Catholicism is great at trying to Christianize some pagan celebration. They don't know how to make real Christians out of pagan people. They don't have any idea how to do that. So the closest they can get is to take some carnal or some secular holiday and sort of change the names on the statues, Christianize it if they can, and voila, these people are now Christians. No, they're not. They simply change the names on the statues and the celebrations. But, um, so, since, since the world um, we live in gets all obs obsessed and excited about pagan celebrations, and let me, how many of you raise your hand some of you I know are aware of this. Raise your hand only if you agree with me and you know that I'm right. How many of you understand that Halloween is not a Bible holiday? How many agree? You know it's not a Bible holiday. Okay. How many of you know that... Um, I realize this one's a little harder to agree with, but how many of you know that even St. Valentine's Day is not really a Bible holiday? How many of you know that Easter and all of its celebrations of um, rabbits, chocolate bunnies, candy, and all of that, um, Easter baskets, uh, how many know that those things are not Bible holidays. That's, that's not a Bible. Okay, good. You're right there with me. How many of you know that that uh, Christmas is not a Bible holiday? It may be a lot of fun, especially when you're five and six years old, if your parents indulged in that. But I didn't see all the hands go. How many of you know that Christmas is not a Bible holiday? Okay. In the United States, it seems as though, and Western countries like England, and it seems as though you have the, the, the Catholic Church had to approach those holidays a little more passively because they couldn't just come right out with paganism and blasphemy for Easter and St. Patrick's Day and so forth. So they had to kind of soft sell it 
to the American people over the decades, and now everybody's indulging in it and enjoy it. You've seen those um, well, I guess it would be a uh, uh, Halloween, but everyone's aware of the the Halloween houses you can go through it's like a big big uh, maze you can go through and you know for 10 bucks go through and they'll see how good how well they can scare you uh in 20 minutes before you come out the other end and uh we know it's you know all phony and yuck yuck and seems like a lot of fun but um And so it seems like a lot of fun at first, but um, for some reason, the holiday of Halloween and devils and demons and evil spirits, that seems to get larger and larger every year. It's just getting bigger all the time. And uh, they haven't, I haven't seen it yet, but maybe it's just taking place somewhere and I'm not aware of it. You know, they have these whole neighborhoods that decorate the entire neighborhood um, with Halloween themes, Halloween scary stuff. It's not... In... Um, I read an article probably 10, 12 years ago about a guy down in Mexico and he's got the skull of his father and he dusts that off and polishes it, puts it in a prominent place every year to show his father how much he loved him. Always seemed like there's got to be a better way to say, I love you, Dad, than dusting off his skull every year for a few days. But people can become very obsessed with it and uh, uh, overtaken with it. And so uh, I entitled this, Why Jesus ruins Halloween. Why Jesus ruins Halloween. You know, uh, part of your growing up is going to have, is going to be having someone tell you no. Telling you that no matter how much fun it seems to you, it is not biblical. And uh, so that's what I'm here for today, to, to, to ruin some of your fun. But why Jesus ruins Halloween? First of all, Jesus ruins Halloween because he doesn't let the dead stay dead. He doesn't let the dead stay dead. Here in uh, Mark chapter 5, he came to the ruler of the synagogue's house, and his young daughter had just recently passed on their way to the house. And in verse 39, Christ asked, Why make ye this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. Now the women laughed him to scorn. We know death. We know what death looks like. Well, they might have known what death looked like, but they'd never seen real life. And real life just walked into the house when the Lord Jesus arrived. Amen. And um, the idea that in Jesus Christ, um, no one dies. No one died. Um, when the Lord Jesus was around, blind people received their sight. When he was around, deaf people could hear. When he was around, cripples could walk or suddenly walk if they had never walked before. And uh, lepers were cleansed and made whole. As a matter of fact, a number of times the Lord Jesus Christ was around when someone was dead and he raised them back to life again. You couldn't even get, you couldn't get sick and stay sick around the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, when the Lord Jesus was hanging on the cross, they were going to come to the other soldiers and break their legs to hasten their death. 
But then when they came to the Lord Jesus, they discovered he was dead already. They couldn't even die until Jesus died first. We sometimes don't read between the lines and come to understand that. But it's true. Jesus was life in, in human form. And uh, only after he died, the other two thieves were ready to die, were able to die. But he doesn't let the dead stay dead. Secondly, let me say this, Jesus ruins Halloween because even the devils are afraid of him. The devils are afraid of him. We sometimes don't think of the power Jesus Christ has to command the universe, yet he has it. And uh, there's not a thing that's difficult for or to the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing. There's nothing you can imagine that would be too difficult for the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he is life. And he holds the universe together. The idea that anything would be too difficult for Jesus Christ to command or to accomplish. Uh, think again. Think again. But um, he caused even the devils and demons of hell to be afraid of him. In Matthew 8, Verse 29, um, get my unclean spirits, unclean spirits were afraid of Jesus Christ. But moving on here, God willing, I'm going to get some new prescription glasses this week. So I'm still struggling and kind of skipping over some of my notes, so I apologize uh, for that. But apart from the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, unclean spirits and devils have to have a field day in um, tormenting people tormenting men, ruining their lives daily. And um, one of the main um, props of Halloween every year, and I don't know if Halloween has grown to the ridiculous proportions around the world as it is as it has here, um, I would like to think not because, however, knowing how people can be, uh, our craziness, our ridiculousness, our foolishness uh, doesn't want to stay inside the borders of the United States. We like to export it. We like to teach other people how to be idiots and morons the way we are. But anyway, in our text, in Mark chapter 5, the devil said to Christ, I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. So, they're afraid of Jesus Christ. They're afraid of his power. They're afraid of his eventual domination and destruction of them. And uh, I, if you were an unclean spirit or a devil, and you know that Eternity is coming soon, and your demise is just around the corner, and it could be any time, any day now. Uh, how could you have any sort of sanity? But then again, I suppose the unclean spirits and devils don't have any sanity. Maybe they don't know what in the world they're doing, what they're thinking, what they're talking about, but uh, I'm so glad that there was an old gospel song, gospel quartet song, um, called Living on the Winning Side. That was a good one. Um, living on the winning side. And that's really what you and I are doing. 
uh, who know Jesus Christ. We're living on the winning side. That's a lot better than living on the losing side. And, uh, but we live on the winning side. Thirdly, let me say this. Jesus ruins Halloween because the work of Satan is stopped by the Lord Jesus. He ruins Halloween because he stops the work of Satan. And not only does he stop the work of Satan, Satan's doom is already predicted. It's already foretold in the Word of God. And I really would admonish everyone here, don't just bring your Bible when you come to church on Sunday. You come next week, and suddenly you've forgotten where you said it. You don't know where to, bring, where to find it, because you haven't read it all week long. Now, don't just do that and bring the Bible once a week. You know, that kind of person, uh, they, they remember to bring it, and then they f forget to pick it up and take it home again. It's, it's very unfortunate. The most valuable item, the most valuable item, physical item, that you own or will ever own is your Bible in this world. The only, the only thing greater would be a physical, would be a, um, something that's immaterial. You can't touch it, you can't feel it. Um, so having the Lord Jesus dwelling inside of you, that's the only thing that's more valuable than having a Bible in your hand. And I hesitate to say that because the Bible is that important to a true believer. Now, years ago, when my kids were small, we were in Florida, and uh, I think one of our kids was ready for her car seat. So we were getting ready to leave church, and I reached in the back seat to buckle her into her seat. But I had stuck my Bible on the roof of the car. You can see what's about to happen. And um, closed the door, got into the driver's seat, and forgot the Bible was right up there on the roof. So we went up, oh, how far was that? Maybe a quarter mile, half mile, and got on the main highway, nine mile road, Pensacola. And um, Sure enough, a minute later, I heard this thump, thump, and looked in my rearview mirror, and I was spreading the word all over the highway there. And of course, by the time we went back to find it, most of those pages were gone, and I couldn't even find it. So I got a new Bible, and this time I got a nice, thick, zip-up cover for it. Um, and the Bible that was in that, I wore it out. I marked it up, wore it out, and now it sits on my dresser. And uh, then I got a new Bible for the same cover. And um, I'm so happy that I thought to do that. But the most important possession I have in life, other than my knowledge of salvation, is the Bible I hold in my hand, the one I could read, and the one I could study and memorize, and the one I could believe was the Word of God from cover to cover. But lastly, let me say this. The work of Satan is stopped. This is why Jesus ruins Halloween. He stops the work of Satan. The man who was naked in, um, in Mark chapter 5, verse 14, the man who was naked was now clothed once again. The man who was violent is now peaceful. The man who is now filled with devils and rage is now peaceful, the Bible says, uh, and in his right mind. The Bible says the man who was um, crazy 
is now back in his right mind and uh, clear-headed and clear-thinking and wearing clothing once again. It wasn't covered up or uncovered with shame and embarrassment. But um, you might think you understand mysteries in the world. You might think you have a great curiosity about things that are, are maybe difficult to fully understand, but you're fascinated with it. You like to explore it. You like to uh, delve into it. You like to sort of learn things you you didn't know before. Uh, however, until you know Jesus Christ, until you know the Son of God, until you know one who loved you enough to die for your sakes and uh, suffered on behalf of you and your guilt and the guilt of your sin, until you know him, you really don't know anything at all. You really don't. What shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And uh, some guys have a great curiosity and a great mind. They can comprehend a lot of subject matter. But until they know Jesus Christ as their Savior and the forgiver of their sins and an idea that uh, their sins have been forgiven and they've been washed clean by faith in the blood of Jesus Christ, they really don't know God at all. Well, they might think they do. A lot of people bluff their way through, but they really don't know God at all. They've substituted paganism and superstition for a real knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and a real knowledge of God. And um, if you don't remember anything else from this sermon today, remember that God, yeah, maybe it's the older God gets, the less he's able to do. So he has to rely on a growing number of helpers called saints to help him manage, you know, the straw brooms and manage candles and manage all kinds of things. Because he, the older God gets, the less time he has to tend to all of these things by himself. So he has to have this ever-growing number of people to step in and do these things for him. Makes me wonder if they had a saint who was in charge of making straw brooms or making candles, wax candles, seven, eight hundred years ago. Do they still need that person today? How many you know, homemade candles do they still depend upon? Oh, I suppose you can find some ladies at a candle and um, candle shop and um, but that's just for fun and artsy decoration it's not something that they need daily because they don't have light any other way so the candle makers are probably uh, not very busy these days <laughs>